In the late 1960s, Northern Ireland erupted in violence that would claim at least 3,256 lives. This was known as the Troubles, which was fought primarily between the Irish Catholic Republicans, who wanted full independence for all of Ireland, and the British Protestants, known as Loyalists, who wanted Northern Ireland to remain under British rule. The Troubles officially ended with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Unofficially, there is still a good deal of tension between the two sides. Uh, my book, Orangutan, covers the first 20 years I spent working as a carpenter after I moved here from uh, Tyrone, Northern Ireland. Uh, my next book that I just finished is uh, called That's That. It's a memoir of growing up in Northern Ireland and it's also a document of the Troubles uh, starting from the year 1968 when I was born. Why don't you tell people what the Troubles are because some people may not know that. So. Well basically there's been this 400 long feud between England and Ireland to break it down its basic terms and England wound up in control of most of Ireland for a long, long time. In 1916, you had the uh, uprising, right, right, uh, at, and, uh, and then in 1920 or 22, whatever it was, the, uh, you, have the, you have suddenly Michael Collins signs a treaty and you have 26 of the counties have been freed, so the northern six counties right. are still under English rule and then in 1968 basically the n Northern Irish Catholics went to war right. w with the English to try and win back the Northern Six Counties. When we entered Slane, the town was in chaos. Gangs of boys ran screaming through the crowd with their fists in the air. We were knocked and jostled in the fray. I allowed myself to be swept along with them. They were northern lads with thick Belfast accents. Brendan and I linked arms with them and skipped down the middle of the main street, yelling the lyrics of a rebel song we knew well. A nation once again, a nation once again, and Ireland long a province be, a nation once again. I didn't think about where I grew up in terms of war. Mm -hmm. As far as I was concerned, that was just how people lived. Right. So as a kid, everything sort of seems normal. A kid in a house that grows up in a house where there's abuse just accepts what is happening as normal. It's not until you have the perspective of being older and looking back that you sort of say, oh, because even when I wrote this book, I had people that I lived with and grew up with would say, nothing really happened where we lived. Right. But where we lived was in, in Tyrone, uh, we lost just as many people almost as Derry and Belfast. It was really, that's where the heart of the war was in the country, was in uh, Tyrone. And it turns out in writing the book that it, I revealed to myself that I was actually very close to a lot of the action that happened in County Tyrone right. at the time and didn't realize how close I was to it until, you know, I finally sobered up six years ago and yeah started looking at it with some kind of clear perspective and, and really trying to educate myself on right. my own history and trying to find out what the troubles meant for me. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's a very confusing situation, even if you've lived there. And part of what I was trying to do in the book was to sort of clarify it, right. not just for an Irish reader, but for an American reader, yeah. where you could pick it up and finally go, oh, this is what happened. Right. Because it's such a cloudy issue. Even, even now.
but what do you think it meant to be, you know, Catholic? I mean, it's, you know, and being like categorized at that time. With, without question, that has formed. Being Catholic growing up in Northern Ireland meant that you lived with an air of repression mm -hmm. at all times. Right. And I don't know if that made me more rebellious than I would have been, or if I was born rebellious and that just compounded my, my, my rebellious nature. But you have this, just to break it down in basic terms, as a Catholic, it didn't matter if you were just going to drive into the local village for a loaf of bread, mm -hmm. you get stopped uh, by a British patrol and they're no older than you are, they're 18 or 19 years of age and it's raining and they make you get out of the car and they humiliate you and you see this happening to your father and to your brothers and to your uncles and men, Catholic men humiliated in front of their wives right. or their children just going about their daily business and that sort of just feeds into this sort of feeling of hatred and repression and anger and and that happened on a daily basis right. throughout our whole lives. It was just an accepted part of what we did. Did it, that give the church a bigger role in, in your lives? Without question, because of, the, because of where we grew up, being Catholic became a number one element of our identity. Even above being Irish, right. we were Catholic. In Northern Ireland, there are two very specific groups it's not even English and Irish, it's Catholic and Protestant. Right. And, you know, it wasn't until I was much older that uh, I was in college here in my 20s that I started asking questions like, what is a Protestant? Right. And then realizing, oh my God, a, a Protestant is actually a Christian too. Yeah. And looking into what that meant and realizing that there was a lot of common sense to the Protestant religion also and realizing that any religion, most of the religions at their essence, are really good. Yeah. It's what people do with them uh, and sort of the distorted nature of, of how we view religion sort of, and people make it ugly. But the, the, the Christian message mm -hmm. is basically the same. In yeah. And that sort of was shocking as an adult to realize that we'd grown up hating Protestants, right. but having no idea what that meant. Right. That, yeah, it, that's well that it was really just a political thing. Yeah. Um, and that, as a, a kid, you were an altar boy as well, correct? I was an altar boy, yeah. and it was sort of an honor to be, to be an altar boy. Right. And not just an honor, it was a lot of fun. Right. You got to be, it, was, it wasn't as boring as... <laughs> you, you, church, you Yeah, and you got, to, you got to be up on the altar, and it right. was kind of special. And you know, it's funny, we had uh, one particular... Uh, incident we we would go out and play tag with our friend with the other three altar boys we would run out and play tag through the headstones right. uh, before mass start and one day we we're playing tag through the headstones mm -hmm. and we listened and one of the guys says oh my god mass has started right. and we're still out there and the priest had just gone and started mass without us so we had to come back in through and like file out onto the altar and there's like 300 people in the, in, in the church and I, I just walk in and the first face I see is my mother's. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, she was fairly strict growing up, wasn't my she? My mother was a strict woman, yes she was. Yeah. Uh, I love her dearly and uh, we're very close. Uh, but I was very angry with my mother yeah. growing up. Uh, as an adult I can look back and see that she was trying to do the best that she right. could with, with what she was given right. in, 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 a, in, a, in an area where it was dangerous to let your kids out of your sight. Right. Boys got mm -hmm. involved in situations where they could wind up getting shot very right. easily and friends of mine did wind up getting shot, very good friends of mine. My mother was, I, I, I think, overprotective, mm -hmm. but I guess I can't really, I can't judge on that. She did what she, here. I'm still here and, and I look back at it now and I think, well, maybe I needed to take this particular path in order to be able to survive and write it all down. Right. That this was my particular path, whether it's chosen or it's destiny or whatever it is, but I've, I've come to accept that what happened happened and that's just the way my life was.
The area that I grew up in, it was impossible as a young Catholic boy not to be affected by the nationalist sort of vibe, the atmosphere. When you have the, the local priest saying from the altar, it's okay to kill in war, that yeah. that's acceptable right. in the eyes of the church, yeah. it sort of opens up a lot of avenues and possibilities and yeah. options. And we really, as kids, sort of revered right. the, the, this sort of, uh, like we knew who was involved, right. but it was unspoken. Yeah. You didn't say to your friend, oh, I know he's involved or he's involved, but the entire community mm -hmm. sort of keeps a, their blinkers on. Right. This doesn't exist within a community without the support of the community, without the silence of the community. Right. So everybody sort of played their role. And then uh, growing up, you realize that these boys who were where you, they were sort of heroes to us. Right. Because we were getting abused by young British soldiers on their own, but these boys were actually doing something about it. Yeah. And as a kid, when you're not sort of, when, you, when you're not dealing with fear of mortality, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of the hero is an enormous thing. Yeah. And these uh, older boys, it seems like a very cool thing to do, to go out and perhaps do something for your country. Right which is the idea. Were you actually approached at any time to join or? You're never approached. Yeah. Nobody, nobody would approach you. Yeah. You would find yourself in a situation where perhaps you had a lot of friends who were sort of in, drift in circle, you yeah. sort of drift towards that circle. And if you were sort of then accepted into that circle, then maybe an opportunity might arise for you to do something, mm -hmm. which Definitely. was starting to happen with me. Yeah. And then, you would sort of from there on and be testing the waters and be tested to see how far you would want to go with that. Once, once it became, once I started you know, losing people that I knew, once I, there was actually a name and a face and a personality mm -hmm. attached to the death and it wasn't just another name that I heard on the news, right. well then that made it really personal right. and you could understand and feel like there was justification right. towards joining the local military right. to help fight back. And that, it, would, it had definitely reached that point right. before I left Northern yeah. Ireland. Uh, so what precipitated the move from London into to New York? Well, I was basically bouncing back and forward from London to Northern Ireland uh, for a couple of years mm -hmm. and getting more enmeshed in the nationalist situation in my community, getting closer to uh, some guys who were involved and f that sort of back and forward became I started running into trouble in England uh, with my drinking and right. that started becoming a problem and then I would come home to Northern Ireland and things would get a little hot and heavy there right. and, and it just, it basically culminated in me realizing that I had to make a decision that I was getting so angry. What happened was uh, Loch Gall happened, mm -hmm. uh, what's known as the Loch Gall Massacre and there were eight young Irish Catholic boys Right. who were in the IRA, who were slaughtered that day, and it was a turkey shoot. Basically, yeah. the British had the information on these young boys. They knew they were going to attack the police station. Mm -hmm. They waited until they did that, and the place was surrounded in advance, right. and then they just wiped, wiped them out. And I knew some of those boys, yeah. and I was very close with their families, and had lived with them in London. And when that happened, I snapped. Yeah. That was the moment where I thought, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to have to do something now. My mother, I won't get into it, but my mother very deftly and, and ingeniously stopped me yeah. in my tracks. Yeah. And uh, I realized that what I really needed to do 
was get out of Northern Ireland yeah. and not get involved, which I did, and then yeah. I came to New York. And it's funny, uh, you know, I, I, I left home, I'm one of my best friends at the time was a, a guy called Brian Mullen, mm -hmm. and uh, I was in, and Brian Mullen was the guy I was like starting to drive for once in a while and mm -hmm. do like a favour here and there, and then I was here three months and Brian was assassinated by the SAS with his brother-in-law and his brother-in-law's brother, and all three of them were, were killed. Wow. So I got that phone call three months after I arrived. Yeah. So... Um, all right, let's let's talk a little bit. You know, coming to New York, which is chronicled in Orangutan, it's you know it's a pretty amazing book. I mean, there's been a lot of books about drinking and trying to become a writer, but I guess part of what I liked about it there was no like self pity and no, mm -hmm. no blaming it. It was very matter of fact. This is what happened. Mm. You know, you disappoint a lot of people. I think you disappointed yourself, but mm -hmm. you didn't make excuses. Right. Is that something that you kind of consciously decided to do going in? Very much so, and uh, my, my editor at Random House applauded me on not hanging anybody but myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was my goal because I wanted to sort of just say, this is what it looks like right. to be a drunk, right. which is what I was. Yeah. And I sort of had reached a point in my life where uh, in 2006 had wound up basically happened to be taken from my apartment to dry out upstate and wound up going to jail for a couple of months and right. things had reached the bottom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saved myself mm -hmm. by, by writing. I sat yeah. down and just started writing yeah. my story and realized that I really needed to get to the bottom of what it was that I was doing in, right. or, in order to save myself, which is, which is how, how the book was written. I had to dry out. I took the four train back to the Bronx and went up to my little attic room with a bottle of water and lay down on the bed and settled in for the long ride back to sanity. The scary thing about drinking alcoholically for years is that you become aware of how your body will react to detoxification. You recognize the symptoms as they are happening and they're as familiar to you as a cold. I was 19 years old and living in London for the first time I went through the delirium tremens when I started to hallucinate that a little girl was standing at the bottom of my bed staring at me. I didn't know what was happening and it scared me half to death. But as the years go on, you become accustomed to this kind of horror. You understand that for every day spent on the run, the price will be a little higher. The nightmare of detoxification will have intensified just a little more. It is simple mathematical logic. What goes up must come down. And the higher you go, the longer and more terrifying the fall. It is this gripping fear of this inevitable nightmare that keeps the alcoholic drinking after a while. Jumping through the porthole back to sobriety means a temporary loss of sanity, and no matter how many times you've gone down that path, it never gets any easier. After a while, the alcoholic drinks to maintain sanity. There is no enjoyment in the booze at the end of a run. Each drink is a battle, a temporary relief from madness. The alcoholic knows that when he can find the strength or motivation to put down the last one, he is in for hell. There is no escape. I envied the Americans who I met who were always off to rehab for the comfy come down. For most drunks, rehab is a luxury we will never know. $3,000 or $30,000 or whatever a week or two in a clinic costs these days can buy an awful lot of booze or pay off an awful lot of debt. Most of the drunks I've met don't run don't stop the run until every last penny is consumed, every bridge burned. We lay in our attic rooms, we slip the devil's noose around our necks and we fall back into the nightmare of reality. That is how it feels coming off a drunk. Did uh, God or religion have any help in, in getting you sober? Well, God, has be God and religion has been basically, you know, apart from you know, being Irish, that has been the driving force through a lot of my own life. Uh, I was raised Catholic. I think that I, I went away from the church for so long and was angry with the church and felt angry that uh, sort of blamed the church for feelings of guilt and shame and feeling less than. And then, you know, as, as I've gotten better, Right. come back to realizing that there's so much goodness in Christianity and that I will still, that I still can see now sort of the universal good in people. Mm -hmm. And 
I think a lot of it has to do with where, how healthy I am. Right. And when I'm healthier, uh, I can see the goodness in, in Catholicism mm -hmm. specifically, right. uh, if, if that's what you're asking about, but I can also see it in Buddhism, I can right. see it in Protestantism, There's, and uh, I think b the basic message when it's all boiled down, when you take like the Quran and the Bible and all these other texts is just try to be a nice guy. Right. Try to treat your fellow man with some level of decency. Yeah. Try to treat other people as you would like to be treated yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the whole deal. Right. That's the whole message. It gets polluted right. by politics and money and, and all this other stuff. But basically the message is just try to be a nice guy. Yeah. If you could do that. <laughs>funny I wrote this play coming out of my second marriage mm -hmm. and I didn't realize until I actually I wrote it 13 years ago right. 14 years ago and I didn't realize until we were in rehearsals to do it this time how biographical right. the actual play was and it really does deal with the end of that marriage and it deals with this situation that was going on <clears throat> that my wife wanted to have a baby right. and for some reason she couldn't and we were going through all these specialists and that's a very difficult uh, and I know a lot of other people now who have done that and that's a right. horrible sort of strain to put on a marriage right. and I guess I wasn't ready it's like the Martin character in the play says at the end yeah. I just wasn't ready and I guess I just wasn't ready right. uh, but I do have now, I, I, you know, I stopped drinking six years ago and I have a daughter now who's five years old, she's right. five and a half, and it has changed my entire uh, perception of what love is. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not sure if I understood ever what love was until I had a child of my own, and now I understand what sort of non-judgmental mm -hmm. love is, because I just love my daughter. Right every day it doesn't matter what she does i just love my daughter and you realize oh this is not going away right. i just love my daughter and that's sort of it's it's an amazing education because you realize sort of what your own capacity for love is suddenly right. and that is an it's an it's amazing because you realize that here's a part of myself that i've never tapped into before right. in any relationship mm -hmm. is sort of an all forgiving love it doesn't matter what she does she's still amazing Great. It's amazing. Um, all right, what about future plans? What do you got planned for the future? This is Kevin McCann, the uh, producer for the movie The Rising, based on Sean McDermott and his particular role as mastermind in... Uh, 1916. In the 1916 Rising, yeah. right? You want to say something about what the movie is? Sure. Well, it's the, it's the first film on the... Uh, Rebellion of 1916, the rebellion to free Ireland from imperial rule, and I am uh, working at the moment with Colin and, and very pleased to do so. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to a production in 2015 and a release of the film in 2016. Uh, we do have a social media platform that we're trying to raise awareness for the movie. We have a Facebook page. We're on Twitter at uh, 1916 movie or 1916 rising at 1916 film 1916 film on twitter and we have two syllables film and we have the uh website the rising.ie and we have the facebook page so if anybody wants to follow obviously they can look us sure up. and at the moment we're, we're 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 at the stage where uh we have some finance a good deal of finance in place but we're still looking for investments and uh if anybody is interested in taking part in what's expected to be a, 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 an extremely significant Irish film, we'd very much like to hear from them. Well, I'm going to, you know, say goodbye and, and we'll see the play tonight, but it was great talking Wonderful. to you. Wonderful. Very nice talking to you too, Terence. Thank you very, very much. Good. Wonderful. Okay. Awesome. All right.